we'll go ahead and get started. So glad to have everybody here with us in person and online today. This is a presentation that we've titled, It's All Relative or Is It? A workshop on outcomes assessment, uh, or on outcomes assignments and assessing student work. Uh, our plan for today is to do a little bit of table setting to take on this question pretty directly about how challenging it is and has been to make that turn from caring about content to caring more about inquiry as we make that shift from the general education program in 2018 to now our inquiry-based AU core curriculum. Throughout the, the presentation, I wanna really encourage folks to, to interrupt, to interject. Uh, you can comment in the chat. Uh, I believe you can unmute and, and uh, talk to us live. Uh, we have a couple of our team members also moderating. We have the, the, the chat here too. So we will also be looking at that throughout. Uh, and with that bit of kind of preliminary pieces, uh, we'll do a quick introduction of, of who we are, who our team is, uh, and uh, get into this. So I'm Brad Knight. Uh, for those who don't know me, I use he, him pronouns. I'm the senior director of the AU Corps and University College. I've been at AU. This is my eighth year, I believe I've just wrapped up. And, I, and I'm Martin Oliver. Uh, I am the faculty chair of the AU Corps. Uh, I'm he, him, um, and I guess, am I 12 years in now? I've got a few years on Brad. It's shocking to say uh, that I've been around this long. I've got an appointment in the Critical Race Gender Culture Studies Department, um, and I'm glad to be here. Do we, should we do shout outs or are they got yeah, they got All right. Can you hear us over here? Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Fringen. I am the program coordinator for the core, uh, and I've been at AU for about a year and a half. And good afternoon, everyone. My name is Diamond Brown. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I've been with AU core for about a year now. Uh, no, six months. Ish. <laughs> I've been at AU uh, for about uh, two years in August. Perfect, thanks. So this is, I hope, a timely workshop because your classes are are only five minutes behind you. You're just about to enter into the summer and probably stop thinking about this all for a little bit. Uh, but before it is too far in the past, we want to keep this memory fresh and talk a little bit about assignments and student learning with a mind to helping you think more deeply and think about revising for the fall or the spring or the next time you're teaching, whether it's in the core or outside of the core. So what we have for you is a bit of, of uh, sort of preliminary terms to think about uh, getting all on the same page. Then Martin has very kindly put himself up on, in front of us as a uh, uh, sort of case study. Um, he's going to be very vulnerable with us and talk about how he's taken up this challenge in three different courses that he teaches in the AU Corps. Um, and thank you to Martin for uh, speaking really directly to the, the places that you've uh, been successful, but more so the places where you looked critically and realized that, that you had room to improve. Uh, and then we're going to make this even more complicated and messy with some big questions that we're hoping that you'll all engage with us on. And then as time permits and as interest allows, we'll break into some all, smaller groups and talk about our own courses and think about how we can take some of the conversation and apply it directly into the work that, that we're doing. All right, so content, it's familiar, it's comfortable. It is the, the kind of learning that, that probably for most of us was how all of our schooling was organized. It was about what and when, uh, interested in questions that, that sought whether you knew the answer uh, and, and really thinks about education as being uh, book smart, uh, focuses on those three R's, the reading, writing, arithmetic, uh, and emerges from a world that, that really thinks about producing a learned person, uh, that the whole purpose of education is that there are a set of things you should know, and at the end, you will have those, and that will serve you well. But I think what we've recognized is that through information explosion, through uh, 
the globalized world, that that is no longer sufficient. It is not something we need to cast aside, but we've got to complicate this mode of learning a bit uh, with inquiry-based learning. And there are many definitions of inquiry-based learning, but one that I really like is to think about it as a form of active learning that emphasizes the student's role in the process. So combining their curiosity and, that, and, and a method or methodologies to help students ask and seek understandings, um, not necessarily to seek answers, although sometimes that's the directionality of, of the work that we're trying to send them toward. Inquiry-based learning is often put under several different constructs um, and, and the, spe the specifics here don't matter a great deal, but I wanna give you some language around which to talk about this a bit more. So it's often under this broad heading of non-cognitive measures uh, with uh, attitudes and beliefs. So thinking about uh, something that maybe we want students to move past, like math is hard. We want them to not think of like, I am not a math person. We want them to help move past that attitude or belief. Um, also our social and emotional qualities uh, like collaboration, teamwork, often a, an outcome that we hope students will achieve uh, as part of their education at, at a university happens in processes. This one is our bread and butter in the core, thinking about metacognition and thinking about thinking. And then lastly, personality traits. Uh, we often think about wanting to produce ethical students, uh, ethical humans, uh, but that's really hard to grasp. And, and like all of these different non-cognitive measures, they can be really difficult to operationalize. When we think about content, it's, it's pretty simple to say what whether the student got the right or the wrong answer, whether they know the fact or don't. But when we make that turn towards non-cognitive measures, it's a bit fuzzier. And this is what we really wanna take on directly today and talk about how we're thinking about that shift that the core made in 2018. Because while it, is often the case that we think about this like the Supreme Court test, we know it when we see it, our obligation as instructors goes past that. We have to, to push ourselves to think about how do we operationalize these difficult things. And this conversation today is, is a first conversation. We're not going to go deep today into the specific rubrics or specific assessment tools that you can use to take up inquiry-based learning. But we're going to talk first about how do you craft questions, how do you craft assignments that set students up to do this work as a first foray into the kinds of shift that you have to make before you can successfully make that pivot fully. With that ultimate goal that we really want to foster students' lifelong curiosity, that's, that's what we want to do. We want students to be lifelong learners. And under this broad heading, we think that content and inquiry need to come together. And in doing so, I really want to emphasize that these two things aren't mutually exclusive. And in fact, they really do have to be interconnected. Uh, this is why the core in its construction moves from those broad foundations into the habits of mind, and then ultimately together with the major, so that you do see the ways that those modes of inquiry, those ways of asking and answering questions come together with the disciplinary or field specific knowledge that students are attaining uh, in uh, attainment of their, their degrees. And it's really in, it really enables you then to move from those sort of baseline questions of uh, like what and when to how and why as you start to see content and inquiry come together. Uh, and, and particularly, it's valuable as we ask students to take up questions like, how do I know? And what does it matter that I know? We really want students to think critically about uh, this uh, knowledge that we're asking them to undertake. I know I did. I said to Martin before we started, at some point in this presentation, I'm not going to use the clicker and I'm gonna think that the computer in front of me is actually controlling the presentation. And there it was. Okay, so with that sort of baseline setting of, of content versus inquiry-based learning, I want to think about how do we design courses with the habits of mind in mind or other courses that put inquiry at the forefront. So 
I'm going to put two different ideas in front of you, and then I'm going to hand this off to Martin. So the first of these is course mapping. And I'm curious, I uh, would love to know from those in the room and those online, how many of you are familiar with course mapping? Have maybe done it for your own courses or at least familiar generally with it? If you want to maybe raise your virtual hands uh, or write into the chat your level of comfort with, with course mapping. Are there questions from the audience about it? No? It's one of those things where not, I think it's possible to be like, what is a course map? What, <laughs> what are we talking about? So uh, uh, feeling uh, ignorant or naive at that level is, is totally appropriate also. Okay. Hang on one second <laughs> before our computer shuts off on us. <laughs> So there seems to be a range of, of familiarity, past experience with course mapping, and that's great. When we think about course mapping, the general gist is that you are using the learning outcomes as a mechanism for thinking about how to design the class. So, yeah, yeah, yep, thank you. So thinking about using that to, to relate those learning outcomes to what you're doing in the course, to both the instruction and also the work that students are doing. And through the process of mapping, you're asking yourself whether that instruction or the assignment is introducing an outcome to a student or it's uh, a moment in time where you are expecting them to achieve sort of final mastery of that. There's an opportunity there to, to pose to yourself the question of whether you're assessing it or if it's just something that you need to do as a, as a way of getting them to that scaffolding. Um, and then you can also think about then, how exactly do you move that student from it, that first introduction to that moment where you sort of lift away the training wheels and are able to expect them to do this independently? Um, and Diamond, I don't know if you want to jump in at all with a bit of more context about assignment mapping. Sure, I can. Um, the basic gist of the course mapping process is to sort of relate it to backwards course design in the same sense that um, you are taking the learning outcomes that you have in mind and building everything around that. So you're thinking about how the assignments tie back to those learning outcomes, how your individual lesson plans are turning back into those learning outcomes, um, how the readings in the of themselves are turning back into those learning outcomes, centering those learning outcomes in, uh, in mind from every step uh, as you are planning and designing your course. Diamond. And, and I think being very uh, sort of candid about the ways in which we often receive our courses, that work, that work of aligning the course to those outcomes and what's happening within it may have very well been done by someone else. And so that may not be work that's visible to you as an instructor when you receive a course from your department or from a colleague. And so taking that moment to see if you can reconstruct how that course was mapped is something that could be really valuable to do. And in fact, I would really encourage you to think about doing that this summer. And part of what you can think about as you take that, that task up is uh, the second part of this, this slide of uh, verb instrument agreement. And this is just a fancy way of saying that the learning outcomes in the core, while built by committee and therefore a bit messy as a result, are intentionally crafted. Every word in those outcomes was intentionally chosen to signal something about what we want students to, to leave these classes with, the ability to do. So. For example, the verb create implies that some form of construction is appropriate. So something is being produced. And as a result, when you think about the kinds of uh, opportunities for students to demonstrate their learning that you want to embed into your course, for that learning outcome, if the verb is create, it wouldn't be sufficient to have them answer a multiple choice question as evidence of their learning. So thinking very in uh, carefully about how those verbs signal what you should do and what you need to prepare students to do. Another good example of this is a couple of outcomes in, in the core 
ask students to, for example, select and apply. Maybe it's a quantitative framework. And that first verb is really key because what we want students to do then is to not just be given a quantitative framework and apply it, but to be able to select one, to know that they have a number in their toolkit and that based upon the thing that they're asked to do, they need to look at the tools that they have available to them and decide which one is the right one for that task. And so as you design your assignments, you may in an early assignment, both give them the tool and ask them to apply it. But later in the course, when you're seeking that opportunity for, for them to demonstrate mastery, the difference then may be that you have given, you don't say which tool that they should use, and then they're just expected to, to take that and, and apply it and figure out which is the correct one. I'm gonna leave you with one last piece before I hand this off to Martin. And it's a, a bit of um, encouragement. Uh, in much of our scholarship and our research, we really care about assembling a number of data points. We care about uh, seeing a lot of information before we feel comfortable reaching a conclusion. But when we're teaching, we often cast that aside. We forget that that's ever a principle that we hold. And we, we think about uh, high stakes exams or final projects as the single point where we're looking into a course and uh, looking for confirmation that a student has learned. And I really wanna push us to think about whether that's enough. Is that really giving us a full picture of a student's ability to achieve the learning outcomes for the course? Have they really developed the habit? Are you certain that they've developed it or have they done it once? The other reason that I really want to encourage you to think about that is that when a student fails at a high stakes assignment, final project, it's really difficult to discern whether that was because they were missing one particular skill or what led to that failure. And so it's really difficult to truly understand then what, to what extent that student has learned or not learned each of those learning outcomes. As we know from the literature on sort of the psychology of education, that oftentimes when you introduce a new thing that you're asking students to try, something else that they've already learned regresses a bit. And so if you're throwing all of this together at the end, and that's the thing, the moment where they're being expected to demonstrate their learning, it's going to be a hard and high, it truly is high stakes in that sense. So I'm going to hand it off, Martin, to you with that bit of setup. And again, I want to thank you for letting us uh, push and prod a little bit on the assignments that you've done. Yeah, uh, thanks, Brad, for that really useful, I think, uh, sort of context and framing for all this. And I want to start with, and this is a conversation that, um, this is a, a sort of a conversation that, that we as a, a team were having. And it, we'll, we'll just begin with a really simple, like, who and what are learning outcomes for, right? And, uh, and I, I think about this, and it's sort of philosophical for me. Like when we built the core you know, six years ago now, right? We're, we're making these learning outcomes. And as I, uh, is that better? All right, um, great. Uh, so who and what are learning outcomes for? When we built the core six years ago, I was sort of thinking back on that process and, and recognized that a lot of those conversations were initially um, sort of institutionally, uh, like the audience was the institution, like all of us, right? Like, what does it mean to build a new general education uh, program? What does it look like? How are all the parts of AU going to fit into this? Are all the departments or colleges going to be represented, right? That's sort of like one audience for those learning outcomes, right? Another audience for the learning outcomes is obviously students, right? Um, but then there's this sort of intermediary one, right, where we go from the sort of like an institution built these learning outcomes sort of for itself, ostensibly for students. Well, the, the translation mechanism is in our course, course and assignment design, right? And so there's kind of a question like, are we taking these learning outcomes that we built uh, into this program? Um, are they showing up in our courses and in our course design and in our syllabi and in our assignments so that we can then 
uh, actually ask our students whether or not th this is the thing that's happening for them as part of their education, right? And it's and so what we're focusing on today is sort of like asking questions about that middle step, right? In uh, to to what extent are we putting learning outcomes into a, a specific and explicit play when it comes to our course and assignment design? And as Brad said, with the case studies, I'm going to sort of offer myself up, and I want to reference back to uh, to Diamond's point about um, uh, sort of a backward design process. All three of the courses that I'm going to share uh, share today um, came at the learning outcomes from three really distinct vantage points, right? And I think that the different ways that I approached those course designs um, ends up showing up in the classes themselves and sometimes for good and sometimes for ill in terms of, in terms of their effectiveness. Um, so the very first uh, course that I'll share is, is in my complex problems class. Um, and it, two thoughts here. The first was uh, when Peter Starr announced that we were gonna have a, a first year seminar called complex problems. I was like, oh, I got one, right, Jerusalem. There's right, and so and so like my whole uh, initial approach to complex problems is like, I know a very complex problem that should be part of the class, right? And then we I went through the approval process. I wrote it up. It got approved. It was all very nice. I I was like, oh, there's learning outcomes. And then I like taught the class. And then a while later, I was like, oh God, there's a lot of learning outcomes for complex problems, and there's lots of parts to each of those learning outcomes, and have I actually thought about the class in terms of each of these uh, categories or not, right? Like I have a clearly complex problem. That's, that's nice, Martin, right? Good job. But, but, but is the class doing the things that we expected the program uh, itself to achieve, right? Which is sort of the next question. Um, so the, the, the question here, right, is, is how do we, uh, yeah, uh, so uh, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on uh, my particular class here because it is a, a complicated one. Um, if you want to know more about it, however, our colleagues uh, Adam Tamashevsky and uh, Becca Comfort are running a CTRL event tomorrow, uh, tomorrow afternoon at one o'clock on designing authentic assessments specifically for complex problems. So just a quick shout out to them. Uh, and if, if you've got a complex problems class you really want to think about, um, they are the experts on that. Um, to my specific class, so it's called Jerusalem Myth, History and Modernity. And uh, what I've got here as an example is uh, three assignments, and they happen sort of in the middle of the semester. They're kind of like the torso, if you would, or the, the, the central part of the, the course's uh, progress. Um, and I frame them as analytical essays, and I'll just read the sort of uh, initial prompt for each one, right? The first one is, why is Jerusalem central to the religious imagination of ancient Judaism? What makes the city of David so important? A few weeks later, we ask, uh, why is Jerusalem central to the religious imagination of early Christianity? Uh, and then a few weeks after that, why is Jerusalem central to the religious imagination of Muslims? How did the Hagia Jerusalem become Medinat Beit al Maqdis, or the city of the Holy House? Um, and, and what I'm doing here and, uh, is really focusing on it, but this was sort of by accident, right? Like these uh, questions, I think, are central for the content of the course, but I, I needed to ask myself in what way are they embracing the learning outcomes for complex problems? Um, I think what they do do is give uh, a good sense of the diverse perspectives, which is the very first of the uh, three, or sorry, of the five complex problems learning outcomes. Uh, and it also requires uh, some real critical reading. Um, and a lot of this comes into, uh, in addition to a sort of a historical text that's common for uh, for the whole of the class and for each of these three assignment prompts. We also look at uh, the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament and, and the Quran to sort of ask about the role that these, uh, that scripture plays in the construction of value uh, for early Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So I think, I think that uh, I've managed to capture, but somewhat by accident, two of the main uh, learning outcomes for complex problems. But this was, I sort of fell into this and had to um, recognize it was there. And uh, I, I think I was lucky that I hit them, but it, it wasn't really by design uh, on my part. Hey, Martin, before you jump on. Yeah. Um, you talked about 
the these assignments being the sort of torso can you talk a little bit more about like how these assignments are scaffolding and setting up this uh like idea of inquiry in the complex problems class yeah thanks simon so um uh there are is, uh, a couple of uh, brief earlier assignments that happen um and then a couple of other things that we do over the course of the semester but the hope is that uh at the end of the semester students will have had some practice uh, in thinking about this one thing, Jerusalem, the city, um, from a variety of points of view, right? But not just points of view, we also talk about uh, the sort of <clears throat> disciplinary ways that we can think about stuff. So there's, there's text, there's art, there's archeology, span there's politics that all come into play. And uh, there are moments where we sort of articulate the specificity of each of those sort of like disciplinary perspectives. And the hope is when we then get to the final, the students have had a lot of practice in adopting different viewpoints and recognizing that sometimes there are uh, intractable tension in those viewpoints and that there's no sort of easy or simple answer, right? I, I say at the beginning of the class and then they kind of like recognize it at the end of the semester, uh, there will be no policy proposals here, right? We're not gonna fix Jerusalem. We're not gonna solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Like that's not happening, right? Um, uh, instead, we need to recognize why it is such an intractable problem, right? And to recognize the perspectives and the humanity and the vantage points on each side, right? And so the, 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 uh, the way I recognize these assignments now is sort of like building to that place where students can, when they put it all together, be like, oh yeah, that's hard, right? And you sort of leave them at that. And, and, and hope that that prepares them well for other hard questions that they're, they'll encounter going forward. Uh, so the next class that I um, will share is my uh, ethical reasoning class. Um, it's called uh, Original Gods, uh, Ethics and Religion in the Ancient Near East. Um, this class is different from my complex problems class in the sense that I uh, designed it very intentionally and specifically with ethical uh, reasoning learning outcomes in mind. I built the class founded upon these four uh, learning outcomes. I worked closely with the ethical reasoning committee. So shout out to uh, my friends on that committee who, who helped me guide, guide me through the process. Um, and the class would have looked very, very different if it were just a sort of like history of the ancient Near East class, right? Which is where my own kind of training might have brought me uh, to that class. And instead it, it radically changed what the class uh, looked like for me. Um, I, I'll give a couple examples and I will not read through um, all of these, but these are two assignments that happen one kind of early and one sort of in the middle of, of the semester or near the end. Um, and uh, you can see in the prompts that I reflect the language of the learning outcomes in really explicit sorts of ways. Um, prompt three in the red text, uh, can we discern any moral principles from the two creation stories? A little further on, that is, uh, were we created for a purpose or teleology? If so, what is that purpose and does it construct an ethical requirement? Um, I highlight that because those are not questions that like I, Martin Oliver, as a scholar, uh, would normally ask of these texts, right? Like that's not my first impulse. But when I wanted to design this class as an ethical reasoning class, I was like, oh, all of these questions, all of the, the learning outcomes are like present in the text if I am explicit about bringing them out. Right? So it's completely changed how I designed uh, the assignments, how I designed the course itself, which readings I ultimately selected, and then how I contextualize uh, uh, those readings, right? The kinds of information that I give for them. Um, it, there's still some clunkiness in this class. I need to revise it a bunch more, right? But, but I recognize that um, leaning on the learning outcomes for the, the foundational design of the class has led to some really interesting sort of like uh, pedagogical places for me and, it, and produced the first couple of times around some, some really interesting student work. Um, Real quick question before you move on, uh, sort of picking up on what you said about uh, kind of your training, perhaps taking in a different direction than these like inquiry based learning outcomes. How do you kind of find that balance in the course between content and inquiry? I think that's uh, a kind of like common thing that people struggle with, especially in classes where, you know, the student population is maybe a mix of, of non majors who need more catching up. How do you uh, uh, kind of like achieve that balance between the two concepts? 
Yeah, it's really tricky. Um, I, I wrote the syllabus and then I cut about half of the stuff and that's sort of normal, right? And then I taught the class and I was like, oh, I need to cut a whole bunch more because I was like, we're going to read all of the ancient Mesopotamian <laughs> myths, right? Like, well, no, no, that doesn't work because I also wanted to do, you know, X, Y, and Z. We're going to do some Egyptian stuff and some Persian stuff. And um, it, I think uh, it's, it's a less is more kind of thing here, right? Uh, it, the students and I don't expect this of them in this class, but it's, it, it sort of drives home, uh, drives it home for me as a teacher when I think about those learning outcomes and asking sort of ethical questions of these texts or texts or what kinds of ethical questions do these te texts ask of us. Um, it illustrates that say like the memorization of dates, places and facts um, is much less important than a deep and uh, co uh, complicated reading of those texts, right? I need to give them enough historical context and background, and we need to talk about that to, to situate these texts properly. Um, but we, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it's not worth the effort to try to do a whole like comprehensive history, right? Um, that, that, it, that doesn't, uh, I don't think it actually would serve the students very well. They can Wikipedia a bunch of things. Like if I make a passing reference to whatever, like you can go look that up, right? What's more interesting is wondering about how, wow, we see these like really fundamental ethical problems showing up in say the Code of Hammurabi, right? Which we still have today in 21st century of the United States, right? And isn't that interesting, right? And what does that teach us about ethical thinking and about the human condition? Right. So backing off on uh, a comprehensive content approach to the course and really focusing in on the uh, the, the the inquiry thing, um, I, I think it's it's changed how I thought about the class in the first place. I think how my students are experiencing and definitely as I and I'll work hard to, to continue to revise this class um, going forward. So thanks, sir, for the question. Um, the last one is uh, my my div course, the diversity and equity um, uh, requirement. Uh, and this class was one where, uh, again, my sort of approach to it and the learning outcomes was was different from the first two. If the complex problems was, I was sort of like cavalier about the learning outcomes, and ethical reasoning, I was like deeply invested in those learning outcomes. With this one. Um, there were elements of the learning outcomes where I was like, yes, we're definitely going to do that. And others where I was, uh, I think it's fair to say, resistant to them. I was like, I, I don't want to do that, right? Or I'm not sure that that's valuable. Or I'm not even sure that's my job, right? I'm not sure that's my role as a teacher and a scholar to, 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 pick, uh, to, to do some of this stuff. So um, it, what I'm going to do is give... Uh, <laughs> a progression of the final assignment from the very first time that um, I offered the course to this past semester and try to illustrate how um, my engagement with the learning outcomes deepened and changed over the course of three successive uh, years teaching this class. Um, and and I, I hope that this is sort of valuable to see how this, this played out for me. Um, the, the first time I, I taught the class, and I'm going to try to give myself a little bit of forgiveness. This was uh, the spring of 2020, so we were in full COVID. It was a brand new class for me. Uh, I had been stuck at home for nine months with two grade school kids, right? It was, it was not ideal. Um, so, but we gave it a shot. I was excited about this class. I'd been thinking about it for a long time. Um, the class is called Islam in America. Um, and you know, we sort of like went through the history of uh, Muslim presence in the United States, dating back to Christopher Columbus. Hit me back on that question if you if you, if you want to follow up about it. Um, and uh, you know, up into the to the 21st century, right? And then they're going to do a final project, right? And so my final project asked them, and it's a 400 level class, right? I'm expecting seniors, uh, and I say. Uh, your project should examine the question, what does it mean to be Muslim in America, right? And then in the very bottom line there, the scope of your final project will thus be outlined by mutual agreement and negotiation. And the idea here is that they're supposed to email me a topic idea, and then we have a little conversation, and then they, you know, do a nice project, and it'll be great, right? Like, smart kids will do smart things. It, 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 it didn't really work very well. Um, I, I didn't give them nearly enough instruction, even having sort of email exchanges with them. I think on top of COVID, everybody's online, everybody's depressed, like it, it kind of sucked. And I think it kind of sucked for everybody. The students didn't have 
access to all of the resources in the library or the librarians. We couldn't like just, they couldn't just swing by my office to kind of talk about it, right? It was really, really um, uh, ineffective. I mean, I, I think a lot of the students worked really hard, right? And did some interesting stuff, but it, it didn't achieve what, uh, what anybody deserved, right? Like it, it didn't do the, the course justice, I didn't do myself justice, and, and, and thus the students didn't get an opportunity to, uh, to do justice for themselves. So <clears throat> last year, got to try again. It was a little better. Um, again, I won't read through the whole of this, but the, the red text, uh, I was like, I'm going to be much more explicit about uh, what, I, what I want them to engage with. And so the red text says, be sure that your final product final pro uh, product, and they can do a variety of things, right? It doesn't have to just be an essay. It can be a PowerPoint or a podcast or a work of art, right? I'm, I'm pretty flexible about that. Grapples with the complicated ways in which Islam as a religious tradition and Muslims as humans have grappled, uh, no, I should have edited that some more, grappled with white Protestant Christian hegemony. That is, at nearly every, every step, the presence of Muslims in North America has complicated, but also participated in the endeavors of white Christians to make America in their image. Ask yourself, how has Islam Muslims navigated, challenged, exacerbated, undermined, or supported this effort of nation building? Um, and, and so I think this prompted some good stuff, right? It's a little bit clearer. It's, it's um, putting an emphasis on this question of Islam or, and or Muslims in America, and what does that sort of um, connection mean or make? Right, uh, uh, you know, we could talk a lot about the, the content of the course, but it, but I think it's seeing how religious or giving the students a, an opportunity to see how a religious minority operates in the context of a religious majority, um, but also attends to questions of race and to power, um, and and it was better, right? Like it was better. We were on campus, even though we were in masks, right? We got to like talk to each other. Um, I think I had a better sense of what the students needed from a class of this sort, right? And, and it, it, it went along, but I still wasn't like completely satisfied. So try three. <clears throat> um, and I won't read through every part of this, but I think just the, the very first red, uh, red sentence uh, helps. The project must, however, indicate the historical and social context of Islam in America via an appreciation for the structural and institutional challenges that white Christian hegemony have posed for the practice, identity, expression, and or lived experience of American Muslims. That language is lifted almost, uh, almost exactly from the learning outcomes. I recognized when I went to revise this again, I was like, I need to do this better, right? And the learning outcomes were the place to have it happen. I was like, oh, they're really smart. Like whoever like built these, like they did a good job. Why was I not using this tool in the first place? What, what's wrong with me? I built a whole class based on learning outcomes before. I just need to rem remind myself to do it again, right? Um, and and I think it was uh, really made a sort of transformative change in my students, right? And it changed my pedagogy. Like when I wrote the this final assignment, I was I was reminded, oh yeah, I have to do x y and z in class in order to make this clear right and it, so it changed what i did as a teacher in the classroom it changed how i talked to my students about their project proposals and then ultimately changed their finals in, in really positive ways um even the the students that it were maybe not the a number one students in the class got it in a way that they hadn't gotten it the first two times right and so i was like ah yeah i can see it here right they're they're maybe they're not doing anything extraordinary but they're connecting these dots about the ways in which religion and religious identities and humans interact with structures of power in a society and negotiate those based upon different kinds of identity markers or intersectional, like it was completely transformative. It was great. So um, that was sort of my like journey through the learning outcomes. Um, I hold that up there to like talk about my successes and failures. I, I'm reminded that I need to go back this summer and uh, look at all my classes again and be like, hey, am I, am I doing this? And then remember that I've got this cool tool, tool of the learning outcomes uh, to, 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 put in my, to have at my disposal as, as a teacher. Um, so I think that's a, I, I will stop there. I'm gonna um, ask you a question to follow yeah, up there, please. which is in that transformation, Martin, that you had 
yourself in in recognizing the shift away from content towards inquiry and the ways in which that that adjusted your approach to instruction, changed how you thought about your assignments and their their purpose in the course. Did you find that students struggled with that? Yeah, it's tricky, right? Um, I, I think I'd naturally been moving for years. You know, every um, let's see. In my field, we sometimes talk about uh, the importance of religious literacy. There's this famous statistic that something like 32% of Americans think that uh, Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. Taking that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so 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 um, it's important to like know some facts right, on occasion, right? We, we got to like know some stuff because it makes us better humans and better citizens and better friends and better colleagues. Um, on the other hand, like their facts are available to us, right? There's all sort of like we can find, we can find information, that's it, right? Uh, the real problem is that there's like, there's, we sometimes don't know, know what to do with all the information that we find. And that's really the critical kind of thing, right? Um, there's tons of like stuff out there and and the shift away from like, memorizing you know the you know all the the kings of ancient israel uh and their descendants and whatever right like is 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 way less important than wondering like what did it mean to be a king of ancient israel and where did it, where did the notion of king kingship come from anyhow and wh why were there kings right those are more interesting questions right um and so, so I found this a really valuable opportunity to focus much more on the why, right? Why is it like this? Why do, why do we think this way? Why do we uh, believe so-and-so to be true, right? Um, and, and that's been transformational and, it, and it's exciting for me. And I think, I think it's tough for the students because they're like, wait, you're not gonna test us? Like there's not gonna be any fill in the blanks? I'm like, no, right? I was like, but we're going to do this and it's going to, and they get a little, a little squirrely at the start, I think, right? They're like, what do you mean there's not a test? I'm like, that would not be interesting for any of us. We can do something much more interesting, but it, but it does give them anxiety, right? And so I think um, we have a responsibility to kind of uh, uh, lead our students into a messier space where the answers aren't clear um, and it also means that our assessment of what they're learning is going to look messier to them, right? Uh, and and so we have an obligation to explain quite carefully, hey, this is the sort of uh, thing that I want you to try to do, and this is why I am evaluating in the way that I have, and this can illustrate a different kind of progress than maybe what you're used to. I think that sets us up really nicely, Martin. For the set of three questions, we want to kind of make this even more complicated. But also, if you all have questions, this is a good time to start uh, interjecting those, uh, and we can take them up. But we've put three different questions in front of you here uh, to kind of start to, to get this conversation started. Uh, the first of these is, what if all of your assignments touch on every one of the learning outcomes? Uh, the second is, how explicitly do assignment instructions need to guide students toward the learning outcomes? Um, and the third, and I think this is the big one, the thorny one, who are learning outcomes for? Um, and who determines what these learning outcomes even mean? So if anybody's got thoughts or reactions to these, I, I think it's um, uh, it could be a really productive conversation to to wonder about the role that learning outcomes are playing for us um, in our in our teaching and in our our courses. Um, oh, we've got a question, a live question in the audience. We're getting a microphone. So. Thinking about what, because that's one that I, so I, I teach in uh, the writing studies program. So we've got our, our outcomes and we think about those quite a bit. Um, I guess for me, I have to think, maybe I want even assignment one to kind of hit 
a bunch of them, but I feel like if I make it hit all of them, uh, right at the start, that's kind of tricky, right? So like, how do, what do you expect students to come in with versus where you want them to go? So maybe if I know that my, you know, an end goal for the class is that students uh, understand that uh, information has a value in a life cycle, maybe for paper one, like that's still part of it, but I'm helping them a lot with the sources that they're looking at and sort of saying, okay, these are some good ones or interesting ones, whatever they might be. So it's still doing that, uh, but I'm helping them a lot. But the idea being that by the end, it's like, no, you have to figure out this conversation. You have to, uh, you know, you're, you're going to have the tools to do the research that you need to do um, and then uh, evaluate it and then sort of put it in, you know, to work in whatever, like usually for me, it's some kind of research paper. I feel like that's kind of a typical uh, thing. Um, uh, because if not, I feel like assessment gets kind of tricky. Um, how can I hold them responsible for things that I don't really expect them to know either until December or until uh, May, depending on what it looks like. So that's my thoughts about one. Can I ask you a follow-up question about that? Um, in, and you know, this will be different for, for all the different parts of the core, but in writing studies in particular, is there a sense that the uh, learning outcomes are specifically scaffolded in a way to lead you to uh, the sort of like final project? Or is that a sort of decision about like when to do one and when to do the other and when to build on them and when to connect them? Is that left up to the individual instructors? What's the experience of those like? I would say more left up to the instructors. So um, when I think about them, do I think about them as being scaffolded, do this first, do this first, do that? I don't think so. I think it's more like this is where all the things that we want them to know how to do and how you want to do that, you can kind of divide it up um, the way that you think would be the most effective for the material that you're using in the class. So. Yeah, so the learning outcomes in that sense are sort of like aspirational, like this is the all the cool stuff and it's not a hierarchy that we want to get to in the end, right? And then it's our, your job, our job, right, to get the students there piece by piece in whatever way we, we as educators feel we can sort of like best achieve that. I think I would agree with that. So that's been my take on them, so. Thank you. I think the other piece that comes to mind for me with this first question is uh, a challenge to myself to divorce grading from assessment and thinking about uh, what is it that I'm doing with a piece of work that a student has, has given me and am I uh, sort of scoring this toward their final grade or am I really thinking about this assignment as a moment in time where I'm checking for that uh, sort of comprehension and their sort of achievement of a learning outcome as it sets me up to do the next thing. And I, I think sometimes we fall into the grading uh, sort of rut of thinking about the purpose of an assignment is for the grade um, and less about that I'm actively incorporating what I'm learning through what students are giving me toward helping me to get them on, ready for the next thing. Yeah, I'll, as Brad looks in the chat at some of our questions, I'll, I'll follow up on, on his point there real quickly. And, and that um, uh, one of the things, and especially in the, the Islam in America class that I, I recognized sort of over its three-part evolution so far, um, is that um, I needed to be more explicit about the learning outcomes for my students, but also for myself, because uh, if they weren't, uh, they weren't getting it, it was my fault, right? Like, that was my fault. Um, and I needed to own that, and I needed to be clearer for everybody. Uh, about what the what the kind of aim was there, right? And so I had to divorce it from grading because if I was like, why didn't you recognize blah, 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 right? I was like, oh, well, because I didn't say it, right? I didn't teach it. I didn't emphasize it. I, I didn't insist upon thinking about um, thinking about it in, in this per sort of particular way or, or changing their way of thinking about a thing, right? Um, so, so I think it's, uh, they're not just, the learning outcomes aren't, aren't grading rubrics. Right, that's not what they are, right? And so it's important to keep that in mind, I think. Mm -hmm. And and recognize them for what they can be, which is as a pedagogical aid. Liz, I see you had your hand raised. Feel free to unmute. 
Thank you. I, I find this whole discussion really fascinating be, because I've been teaching for over 30 years. So, so this is to a relatively new discussion. Um, and when I started teaching, I taught in both undergraduate and law schools. And I, about a um, little over 12 years ago, I started teaching, I'm a visiting professor at AU, just for, for, for reference. Um, and I started teaching as the law professor at a school of public health. And that was really fascinating to me because learning outcomes in the law school environment is all great, um, geared toward accreditation and passing the bar. We need students to learn certain things and certain techniques in order to pass the bar so they can become lawyers. Um, in the School of Public Health, I was teaching both undergraduate and graduate students, and we had learning outcomes um, tied to competencies that were defined by our accrediting body. Um, and so the, when I arrived on the thing, I was all of a sudden asked to map my entire course and show how everything I assigned from a reading thing to an assessment, um, to my lectures tied to every different types of learning objective and competency. And I found it very frustrating and, and difficult. And um, so I started studying this and saying, okay, how does this, do, does, do the students care? Um, and one of the things I quickly found out because, you know, um, at the School of Public Health, we're very um, uh, assessment oriented, both in terms of how we do things as well as our students, you know, I started surveying my students and do they even read the competencies and learning objectives in my syllabi? And they don't. They didn't for years and years. Um, and they don't actually really believe when we talk about learning objectives and how they're important um, very often because students are in the worst position to understand why things we're teaching to them are important because very often it doesn't become important to them until years later when they're in the work world and having to you know, do these types of things. Um, so one of the things I've been doing more recently, actually with in conjunction with a um, program here at CTLR, um, talking about specification grading, is that I've been tying my grading to my learning outcomes and, and doing it in the forms of different types of graphics for my students. So I've been using sort of Bloom's taxonomy and going through and explaining what the different assessments are and how those learning objectives are, you know, the assessments are tied to measuring the mastery of their learning objectives. Um, and it's been interesting to see. I, I'm not going to tell you that it's been the panacea for the buy-in, um, but, but they are more understanding what I'm trying to do and why it's important. Well, it's been fascinating. Liz, can I ask a, a follow-up question? I mean, you're still Please. Um, it, I'm curious, right, the, the way you described that initially, both in the law school and then sort of uh, when you moved to, to public health, um, is that the learning outcomes objectives, and there, sometimes people differentiate between the two of those, but we won't have that conversation now. Um, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, that they were that they're sort of like for accreditation purposes, right? Which is interesting when we think about the the audience of a learning outcome, right? This, they're clearly for accreditors. Um, do you find that uh, uh, they are also for students, or is that, or is the it's sort of like we're we're teaching <laughs> if we're no longer teaching to the test, we're teaching to the accreditors. Right? Well, I, I think very much, um, and, and my concern in, in is very much as we're moving more and more to teaching to the accreditors, um, which personally scares me because, um, you know, it means a limited number of people are defining what's important in classrooms. Um, and that's been one of the challenges that, that not just my school, but all schools at Penn have in terms of having to do that. Um, you know, our students in the law school environment, they're being measured because they have to pass the, the exam. Um, and, you know, that that's also accreditation is a concern when they have to pass an exam because what you need to pass the exam and the competencies you need for that are not necessarily what you need for practicing in the field, whether it's law or public health or anything else. Um, so I'm, I'm not loving that aspect of teaching to the accreditors. Um, but in theory, the, the accreditors, and I've worked on doing accrediting things, both as being an accredited body and, and, and working on teams, in theory, the accreditation, what's said of the competencies and learning objectives are designed for the students and to make sure that all instructors are teaching in a way that 
our students are going to have the skill sets they need when they move into the workspace. Yeah, thanks for that, Liz. It also reminds me too of some work that our colleagues in the Complex Problems Program have done this year uh, as they worked with students to think about how the uh, learning outcomes are sort of relevant to the students um, themselves. Becca, I don't know if you wanna jump in and comment on that work. Sure, yeah, I can um, share a little bit about that. So, you know, essentially we were, working on a um, research question about how do the complex problems learning outcomes transfer into students later academics because complex problems is in the first year and then also there are career pathways um, and our student we had a student directed um, committee working on this research question and they asked us to start with the question of our students even familiar with the learning outcomes kind of like what you were talking about um, just a minute ago and what they found was that students were not really familiar with the learning outcome terminology, but then when they were prompted to think about, okay, these are the learning outcomes we meant to have, then they were able to discuss the ways that the seminar they were in um, worked on those learning outcomes. They were able to talk about specific assignments that worked on them. Um, and the students that we worked with really kind of pushed us to keep asking faculty to be explicit and intentional and transparent about what those outcomes are um so that they can make those connections more easily I think yeah thanks for that Becca and Ludi this ties in to what you had commented in the the chat about how students use those learning outcome language how they use that language in the assignments that they're submitting and joining that conversation yeah um and I have been this semester I was very very explicit on to asking students to use that language just to see in the final in a final uh, video project that they did um and and they did try and the, the fact that they are using that language gives me a little bit of comfort but at the same time I realized I noticed when they were presenting that um you know like everybody was using the same kind of language and I uh, uh and they were they were laughing when that happened and it is because probably I mean they have heard me say these words and in the instructions and all that in, in different uh, sessions but I don't know how sort of sincere that was on their part you know it's just a requirement to use that language but I don't know if they really sort of incorporated that it was correctly used in the context of uh, what they were doing but uh, I don't know it, maybe it was it was the class but uh, I felt not all too well, you know, being that explicit that way. So it's complex, I guess. Does anybody, and, and this sort of comes out of what you're just saying, Moody, but I wonder if anybody else would want to sort of think about this, that when we've had this conversation as we've begun our assessment of the core in different committees over the, over the year, to wonder, um, uh, so we put the, or we hopefully, please everybody do this, put your learning outcomes on the syllabus. Um, <laughs> valuable for all of us. Uh, but but th there then becomes a question of like, so how explicit uh, is best to be about those learning outcomes? Like, do we talk about them all the time? Do we borrow those the language from them as like a couple of my assignments suggested? Uh, do we say in an assignment, this assignment is, for learning outcome two and four, right? Um, or do we like not mention them at all, but sort of still think very uh, explicitly about how we're doing it as teachers and kind of like, it, this sort of, as Becca was sort of implying about complex problems, sometimes the students had no idea, but then when prompted, they're like, oh yeah, I did all that, right? And, and we kind of like trick them into doing it. Um, it I, I wonder if, if folk have thoughts about what are the best practices for, um, explicit student engagement with the language of those learning outcomes and and how that sort of plays out in, in student experience. Yeah, here in the room. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for this. I mean, it's very interesting. And I think, Martin, it's very challenging for you as well, just having to talk about your own courses. So I appreciate it. And I was thinking something that I've done, and Ludi was there on the Zoom, and she was mentioning something similar. And I've done it with her sometimes in courses that we have shared and sometimes by myself, but I've done it with courses that are not core courses, so any course really, and for quite a while, is to have the learning outcomes, the assignments, 
and match them. So after every single assignment, it says this assignment meets outcome one, two, or three, four, or all of them. Very, very seldom, I have to say, an assignment would meet all of them. But it does indicate which one. And when I assign the assignment, I would repeat that. So it's it's in the syllabus, and I usually go through the syllabus, not all the different, you know, the minutiae, the details, but I do go into those, trying to make that connection between learning outcomes and assignments. And then when I assign, you know, the work, I go back to this and just be mindful that we are meeting these outcomes. I think, I, don't, I wouldn't say that this has been, you know, a practice that I can be, I can say, has been successful or not, I, I don't really know. Because then what you have to do is when you, when you assess those assignments, is follow exactly the same. And this is more complicated. Because sometimes the students are doing really very interesting things and they might not have followed, you know, the outcomes explicitly, but maybe implicitly. So that gets a little bit complicated, Robert, you know, at well, that point. Yeah, thank you, Nora. And it gets back to that question of like, are the learning outcomes there as sort of like a grading rubric mechanism kind of thing or as, as a sort of bigger like uh, the, the point of the liberal arts? kind of question right um and and i don't know that we'll resolve it today but i think really reflecting on it and like the way in which we do choose to use the learning outcomes is is important in, in that consideration i think this specifically speaks to the way that the core learning outcomes are crafted as an asset of them because they focus on specific modes or ways of knowing they lend themselves more to a specific uh more specific uh, tool or sort of thing that you can hold on to, which then we like hope they'll transfer to other settings. But uh, unlike something like we want you to become an ethical person, we can teach ethical reasoning. And so that's something that we can describe and then begin to operationalize and then provide them with opportunities to move between contexts and employ and ultimately we hope that they're drawing upon those as they move through their education even when not prompted and I think this speaks to uh, Hannah what you were describing a little bit when you were thinking about this question of the difference between guiding students towards the learning outcome or helping them to recognize the alignment um, and I wonder if you have further thoughts of, on that or even just thinking about like how we can even in maybe not necessarily the specific context of a course where you're teaching them ethical reasoning, uh, sort of create that nudge that like in, encourages them to draw upon that from a prior learning experience. Did we maybe lose Hannah? We lost Hannah. Um, I wasn't sure that that was oh, yeah, 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 for yeah, me I to know. speak. <laughs> I don't know if I really have anything to say, but I think it, it, maybe it's just semantics, right? But I guess my question was more about, um, well, maybe it's making me think about the agent, like whose responsibility is it? Is it our responsibility to guide students towards them or our responsibility to provide learning opportunities and experiences that kind of like push students towards the learning outcomes, but then just pointing out how and why we did that. Um, so is, it, is the work on us or on them or should it be both? And it might depend on the assignment. Do other folks have reactions to that? I just know that the, the learning outcomes, uh, similar to what uh, Martin was saying earlier, uh, they provided me with the language to write instructions for, for sort of the bigger assignments. But as we discussed very often in, in, the, in the cultural inquiry uh, committee, um, there are many things that happen with, uh, with an inquiry kind of methodology 
that happen that, that are not necessarily assessed or evaluated or graded by any chance, but just sort of in, in mere interaction or the ways in which, you know, like the class develops um, and, and the learning outcomes are right there. And it's not something that you are explicitly saying, you know, this fulfills learning outcome one or two or three, uh, but it happens. So, so inquiry is a kind of methodology that it's not only seen in the things that you can grade. I mean, it should be present and more than grading things is as be more aware what the learning outcomes really mean, but also how to make them work in sort of everyday interactions. And um, like in, in, in every session, it's, it's like, it's, it's a methodology, it's how you do things in the classroom for the students to really fulfill those learning outcomes. Um, just a kind of activity, uh, 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 you know, pair work, uh, you know, group work, whatever it is, simulations, anything that you do that sort of prompts that kind of, of, of inquiry, right? And so um, it's complex, but, but it, it, and it doesn't necessarily mean that students uh, are uh, explicitly or using either the vocabulary of the learning outcomes or us telling them this fulfills this or that learning outcome, but uh, it is also successful, I guess. Ludi, would you, would you say that then in, in that sense that learning outcomes are a responsibility but not a rubric? Um, I mean, I guess I, it depends on, you know, like if you are giving uh, instructions and what you want them to do, uh, you know, incorporates the language of the learning outcomes, then it should help us also design a rubric that, that should be followed. But it's also um, in other kinds of activities that are not necessarily to be assessed or graded, then it shouldn't be included in there. But if it is for a bigger thing, yes, I think so. I think so. But in, in that case, it would mean that students would also need to know what the language of the learning outcomes is, what it explicitly mean by that, what we mean when we say this learning outcome, right? Or when we use it in instructions, students need to know what that means, right? I, I, I've been teaching uh, cultural inquiry for quite a while, and sometimes I even forget that I'm teaching uh, cultural inquiry. So when I am more, more uh, conscientious about using that kind of language, students end up using it. Uh, somehow I see it or doing without necessarily being that explicit. But I think that they would help for a rubric when the instructions are very specific uh, with that language. Thank you, Ludi. I don't know if I'm right, but this is too complex. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think I think giving us all a chance to sort of uh, puzzle through it together and, and think about the ways that it it happens or doesn't or ought to or maybe we wish it did or uh, if we've got su successes to share. Um, uh, we thought about uh, doing uh, uh, some breakout sessions, but I, I think um, a lot of us are on online and and maybe we could just do it as a a, a group. We could even. Um, um, Brad, can we copy those questions and put them in the chat and then uh, go off uh, and get a, everybody's picture up and just do a group discussion on the on the Zoom? Does that work? Yeah. Yeah. So so maybe we'll just uh, try to have a, a conversation together with all of us um, uh, in, in one space. I don't think there's that many of us. Um, the, uh, and maybe we don't uh, introduce all of one another, but uh, we had a couple of conversations here that we, we thought we might have together if, if folk wanted to sort of volunteer or or share or ask questions um, uh, about the ways in which the learning outcomes are, are working for them or you struggle with them, right? Uh, feel free to to share frustrations. I think uh, oftentimes that's that's the most interesting is when there's a, a place where you can be like, I don't know if this is working for me um, and have these conversations together. Anybody else here? Uh, uh, can, the questions are in the chat. Can you uh, raise a hand or? While folks think, Martin, a question that I had earlier that I didn't uh, get a chance to, to ask, 
we've been talking a lot about uh, aligning assignments and, and student work to these learning outcomes and how that has uh, shifted the balance away from content or, or what's at the forefront. How has that changed how much or how you're assessing content when you do? Doesn't mean you're not assessing content ever, does it? Yeah, I mean, like like facts matter, right? Um, and and uh, it, we need to ensure that we are all, you know, operating in the same reality together as much as humanly possible, right? So th so this is important, right? And and uh, sometimes uh, having a bunch of information uh, is foundational for. Uh, getting us to ask uh, difficult questions, right, or to really engage in that inquiry stuff. I think um, uh, what what the shift to to an inquiry focused approach has done for me is to um, give me permission to be like, all right, we don't have to know every single thing here. What is really the critical stuff? That we can then use as a as that foundation for jumping off into um, those trickier kinds of questions or conversations or um, debates. So, I, I you know, um, good syllabus design often reminds us that less is more, right? And I think a, an approach, uh, an inquiry-based approach uh, to your syllabus um, ought to further support that sometimes less is more uh, opportunity, right? Um, that doesn't give us a pass, right? It doesn't say, oh, like none of it, you know, like the, the stuff doesn't matter. We, we still, we still need it, right? It is the, it is the, the meat of the whole, of the whole thing, right? In, in some sense, right? Um, but, but what, what we're going to do with that is, is, uh, I think the more philosophically and pedagogically interesting question, and um, you know, I'm not sure if that quite gets to all that you're asking. But. Yeah, it does. Thanks, Martin. Uh, I have other questions for Martin, but I want to hold those if if folks have thoughts about their own classes, about your successes, about what you're still feeling like you need to do some work on, um, and and how those learning outcomes are coming into play in your own. Uh, instruction and, and assessment. Um, can I ask you, Martin, something in relation to your courses and the instructions that you shared with us? Um, and it is uh, the same thing that I was uh, asking before, and it is how much of the language of the learning outcomes did students use in the final products, either the podcast or the videos or the papers that they were that they were uh, that they submitted. Yeah, I don't. I didn't track that they used the language of the learning outcomes in their in their sort of final projects, right? What I did notice was over the course of you know three different years teaching teaching that class that their engagement with the intention of those learning outcomes changed dramatically, right? That they sort of they got it in a way that they had. Now this, I think. You know, I got better at teaching the class. We weren't 100% on Zoom any longer. Like, there's a lot of of things, but I, but I think, um, I think me being more explicit in the classroom, uh, in regards to the sort of structure, the the learning outcomes as like a, a structural mechanism, um, produced in their final projects, uh, more complex, insightful. Uh, uh, and uh, sort of astute projects, right? So they weren't they weren't necessarily using all of those words, but the, they illustrated, I think, quite clearly, um, a more sophisticated engagement with with the ideas, right? So so uh, it, for me, it was it was apparent, right? We'll see. I, you know, I'll teach it next year, and it'll be a complete flop, and then I'll have to go back to the drawing board, maybe, right? But um, it, it, uh, at least in this one case, it seemed to be. A, a real regular progression of um, the the more clear I got about my use of them, the more sophisticated student uh, student work became. Kate and then Liz. Okay, 
So I think one of the questions was about putting the um, the outcomes on assignments. Is that right? So I I, I mean, I, I'm just sort of how I struggle with these things. So I think um, I do try to do that, uh, although I probably will then forget to do that sometimes. I don't know. And then you go back at merit, and you're like, why did I do it this way, and then not this other way this other time? But I feel like it's helpful for me. Uh, because, you know, when you've been teaching the same class or, you know, in the program for a long time and you were part of the group that came up with these, um, to sort of feel like you know them. Uh, but if you really make yourself think about it, it's like, okay, well, is, have I just imagineered something that sounds cool? Uh, or am I actually meeting some of the goals that my program wants me to? And since we teach like literally a hundred sections, um, I think that's really important to make sure students are getting, um, getting what they need for success. Um, but I do feel like, and something you said right at the beginning is like, I'm, I'm just sort of struggling with this now. So, so how much are learning outcomes grading? Because I think they are to some extent, right? But then there's others, you know, sort of ideas. One of ours is that, um, that research and writing are met metacognitive. It's like, okay, how do you slap a grade on that? I think I can see students doing it, but like, is that a, is that a grading thing? How do I get at that? Um, and then I think for me, the thing that I've been struggling with, and maybe this is sort of something that came up in COVID where we couldn't, as you said, Martin, like we didn't have students in the room with us. We couldn't kind of like see what was going on with them is you've got learning outcomes and you've got uh, assignments that sometimes are graded and sometimes aren't. Uh, and then you also probably have a rubric that has sort of something to do with learning outcomes, but sometimes that language isn't there. Uh, and then you have some mechanism like Canvas where you're checking things off. Uh, and how do all of these kind of work together uh, towards sort of these larger programmatic goals? I have no answers, except that these are the things that I've been, uh, that I've been really thinking about as like a few years in uh, do we need to kind of take a look at those things and figure out how they're all functioning together? And if, I mean, I do, I do think they function together, but could they, could they do better? So those are some things that have been on my mind, trying to relate um, these outcomes to the other sorts of tools that we're using and student success and what they get out of our classes. So. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think we have any interest in being explicit about like this must look like this. Like that's that's not interesting to us, right? But but having but having that conversation that you just suggested, that, I think that's where the real value is, right? Is for us to be really conscious of what we're doing and why and in what ways and how um, how how all those parts are related, right? Because I, I think it makes for a better class and a better experience and ultimately really serves our students better. And I would also add that. Uh, there's a value to a sort of check on ourselves that comes from being in community with one another and talking more about our teaching practice with one another so that we could look at Martin's assignments and each of us probably was reading through them and deciding for ourselves whether we thought those were or were not actually any good <laughs> in service of those learning yeah. outcomes. And there is in this conversation, the tension between being explicit or implicit about the learning outcome that you're hoping a student is employing. But if it's implicit, how implicit is it before it's invisible or not <laughs> present? Yeah. And, and then as we go through assessment, as programmatic assessment, would we, uh, our colleagues looking at these assignments and then looking at students' work, see that think that the students are failing to achieve it, but that they were given the opportunity or, or is it that we don't think they were given the opportunity? And how do we connect all those dots to ensure that the program is delivering upon the aims that we have for it? Yeah, that's, that's the challenge. Liz. So I wanted to ask a favor, if I may, since I have all these um, brilliant minds who are thinking about it. I've been working on this for my summer course today. And um, I was hoping, if you don't mind, could indulge me, if I could share my screen and show you how I was trying to explain it to my students what I'm doing, and if I could get feedback from this group in terms of, uh, because there's only two slides in their visual. W would that be possible? Absolutely. You should have screen shareability. Okay. This is great, Liz, a live. Uh, you know, I, I figure, what the heck, I'll begin to be vulnerable, okay? So, so this is, um, the, it, I identified the, the, the learning outcomes, and these are the four learning outcomes 
Um, this is for a course not at AU, it's at Johns Hopkins. And um, the when I submit a syllabus and had the course approved, I had to have the learning outcomes as well. Uh, and my course is highly scaffolded. So what I have this here is, and I sort of explained to them Bloom's taxonomy and have the learning outcomes of the course going from sort of the lower level Bloom's um, learning outcomes to the higher levels and explaining what the different um, assignments are. And, and I had already done it. So basically the quote unquote homework assignments, if they did those um, uh, um, successfully in mainly pass fail low stakes environment, that got them to a C. And I was sorting out the A's and B's with the higher level things that really require, required analyzing critiquing. So that's what I'm explaining. And the stuff in, um, uh, it's hard to see on this. It's easier to see in, let me see if I can expand it. Um, are the learning outcomes for the course and then what the assignments are in terms of how you would earn points in order to do it. And then that translates, here we go, to um, grading bundles. And again, it's the same thing. The grading bundles, the C bundles are sort of the lower level um, Bloom's taxonomy kind of a thing that gets you up to a C. If you do that, you're, you know, you're doing the minimum, but you're, but you know, your lower level um, course objectives. And as you move up and do more of the assignments and more of the assignments successfully, that gets you into the B and the A grade bundle. So Liz, are you, uh, how do you feel, like, how do you feel about this? Like you're, you're willing to share it with us. I'm wondering what, what, how you, what, what your kind of take on what you've put together here. Well, I'm, I'm I'm trying to explain it in 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 a way that will be you know doing through. I had gone through and explained sort of what these things do and how they're scaffolded and you know the different things of terms of mastery, um, but um, I don't know. It's like I've been encouraged to be more transparent about what I've been trying to do, and um, uh, I don't know. Am I being more transparent, less transparent? Does it help? Does it not help? No thoughts? There's a little movement in our room here. Where I'm wondering. Ah. <laughs> um. I think one question uh, that I would have about this is uh, uh, just like who your student population is, um, uh, kind of like what uh, what sort of like level is this at? Um, uh, like these are graduate students. Oh. Well, and in so doing, I also think about the uh, familiarity or past experience with the kinds of concepts that you're introducing to students around just simply the the construct of blooms and whatnot such that they do they understand the uh the dots that you're trying to connect for them do they have the kind of uh first order pieces of of what is blooms how does how is learning achieved more generally um, or, or does this sort of just seem? So, so some will and some will not. That this is something that we have been trying to explain to our students and sort of make you know the whole concept of learning um, outcomes and different levels of what you're learning and things. But you know, some of them get it and some of them don't. Some of them are in the beginning of the program. Some of them are at the end of the program. Looked a little bit, Liz, to me, and I, I don't know if, if you've gone into this, some of our colleagues and uh, um, uh, some of our colleagues in CORE have, have started to embrace uh, sort of labor-based grading, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, and some of what you presented there looked like it was uh, along those lines, right? There's it is. Baseline yep. stuff, right? And then if you do X, Y, and Z, then, then you're going to get the grade, right? And I, I think my question always is, and this is not meant... Uh, disparagingly at all. It's always sort of me pondering through it is, um, does, uh, to what extent does sufficient completion of tasks 
relate to uh, sort of intellectual change, engagement, uh, conceptualization, right? Like, like how do we balance the sort of like uh, checkbox of, of tasks to do versus like learning in a more messy, complicated kind of way? Well, see, I, I agree with you. And, and that's one of the challenges that I've had. But we, we had a group of students at my university who were very upset with participation grades. And some of these things came out with, well, how, what do you define participation? And, you know, so I sort of love that loose, messy kind of thing in terms of participation and encouraging debate and things like that. Um, but what we're getting into is now where, you know, there's it, particularly when some of the classes are online, some of them, of them are in person, you know, how do you define participation? What are you going in? And efforts to try to bring those into what it means um, in, in terms of, of meeting and mastering these learning objectives. I'm struggling with it. A comment in the room. Hello. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. And I think it we have to expand. It's not how they participate. It's how personal, not personal, like they have to share their thoughts, but I don't want them, I tell my students, you should never be describing something to me, but you should be explaining how it relates to you. So like the style, like the connections and the growth and the learning you are getting from that. So they do research of movements. Let's say a student wants to research the hashtag me too movement. Please don't describe it to me. I can find that on Google. Why did you choose this? How does that relate to you? How has this changed your perspective? How has that gone? So I do a very dialogue heavy based class. They do not need to share their personal stories on there, even though it is dialogue. What I ask them to share is how does this course content, how does the reading expand or make you question what you have experienced and learned? So I allow students to either verbally participate, they can submit to me written assignments. If they're on Zoom, they can message me privately, they can message the full group, they can do smiley face emojis, but um, you know, like just asking them more of that sort of critical pedagogy, right? I don't see, need them to regurgitate. See, I agree with that. And that's how I would have defined participation well, because you know, like you, I've been teaching for a while. Um, but my students were talking about participation as including discussions they had outside the classroom with their colleagues. And I was like, to me, that's studying, that's not participating. Yeah, so I have, we have that as part of uh, engagement with content. So do one of the things, so I ask, we ask in this class, students to engage with, uh, engagement is based on student to content, student to peer, student to self, and student to instructor, or like in the class. Um, it's not participation in the class because I ain't there to see it. However, it is engagement with the content outside and connecting it. And so that's something they, I have had students bring in. They're like, oh, in my critical race and gender studies or my Arab world studies class, we talked about similar concepts on decolonization or, you know, the, uh, you know, Ed Edward Said was written and I think he has the same connections or whatever it is. Um, so that's great because they're connecting with the content, but that is not participation in my class and with me. See, that's what I would agree with you, a whole hard play. Yeah, we can give opportunities, right? And maybe this is the thing we can make space for students to indicate how they're engaging with that content. I mean, I, I asked, it, it almost felt like sort of a throwaway line in, a, in an assignment in my, my Islam in America class this semester, where I was like, oh, and please tell me how this has changed how you think about. And the students latched onto that like really yeah. quick. And I got some of the best essays and it was like, I was like, oh shit, that, that worked really good. I gotta do that again, <laughs> right? Um, so, so maybe we think about the ways in which we, right? We're, we're not gonna give them credit for conversations with their friends in a coffee shop. But yeah, we can, but we can give, which is great. We want to encourage it. I'd love to see it, right? But right. we can give them opportunity to talk about how those conversations have helped uh, or have shown up in in their engagement with with the stuff that we're doing in, in the classroom, right? And bring it back in, right? And 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 allow space for that. And to bring us full circle, I think it's structured and intentional design 
from the point of, of departure, those learning outcomes, and thinking about how everything that's unfolding in that learning conversation interacts. And, and I know that we're at our time and I don't wanna to keep people beyond, but wanna sort of thank you all for, for being part of, of this opening conversation. As I said at the front end of it, uh, we didn't go into the, the sort of final piece of this of like, what is a rubric for uh, a sort of assessment of inquiry, but we wanted to think about like, how do you ask questions in ways that foster inquiry and not uh, sort of fall back into content, that com familiar, comfortable space. And so we'll continue those conversations and encourage you to, to raise your questions about how to do that and to be vulnerable in the way that Martin did. Thank you again, Martin, for, for letting us sort of look into your courses um, and uh, look forward to, to talking with you all more. Wanna wish you all a great summer if you are around campus or if you are working on your courses and want to talk with folks about them, we're happy to create those opportunities. So please do contact us. They've put the, the anonymous survey into the chat. So please also fill that out. Your uh, feedback is, is valued. Yeah, thanks so much, everybody. We really, um, the core especially hopes we can be a place where we can have these conversations about pedagogy, what good pedagogy looks like, what it means, um, and how we can make it happen. So uh, I would welcome any of you to, to join us in those conversations. Um, we'd love to have you and we want, we want to do more of it. So thanks, everybody. Thanks to CTRL and, and Naziha and everybody else, uh, Sarah and Diamond. Um, everybody have a glorious summer. Um, it's a nice day out there. So, you know, do some gardening. <laughs>